So we have been looking in these uh, this past month at the subject matter of truth <coughs> versus tradition. And um, we've uh, looked at, first we looked at the integrity of God's word, then we looked about uh, what the scriptures say about heaven, and then last week we looked about what the scriptures say about hell. Today we're going to begin studying the subject matter of angels and demons. Uh, <clears throat> I had no idea what a popular title that was, Angels and Demons. It was a song and, and other things. Movie and, yeah. Well, um, tradition versus truth. You know, what difference does it make? I, I, the, what difference does it make if, if we think that people who are dead are living in heaven now or if then when Jesus comes back they are raised from the dead? Why, why be so persnickety about these details of, of uh, what the scriptures say and what is traditionally believed? Well, it, it's, uh, anything that's founded upon error is going to have ramifications to it. Anything founded upon truth will also have ramifications to it. The, the things that John taught last weekend, which were, was an excellent presentation, John, thank you so much. As a matter of, I, if you haven't listened to that, I highly recommend that you, you, you get online and you listen to the teaching because it's excellent. And for that matter, you know, it'd be a, a nice thing for you to, to play for your friends and your relatives that don't know about these things because it's, it's very, very important. It'd be nice if you could put that in a little booklet now that I'm thinking about it. Uh, you know, there's a lot of books written, long books, but I thought you, you handled it in a, a succinct, clear manner uh, explaining these very important truths. But... But if you believe that the dead are, for example, here's a, a tradition. The tradition is that the dead are, are not dead, they're alive, they're in heaven or hell, or in some cases purgatory. And, and again, this is not, again, what the scriptures teach. So what difference does it make? Well, the, di the difference for some people, uh, like myself, when I believed this doctrine, I, I prayed for my dead relative. And, and I was praying for them and praying for them, and I did it consistently for years. And then for some people, they talk to their dead relatives. And for some people, it opens them up to uh, spiritualism and into uh, the occult and other things because they think the dead are alive and the dead are talking to them. I mean, it has, it has major ramifications, this wrong uh, error, this, you know, not knowing the truth about this great important subject. Such is the case also with angels and demons. I mean, not, not having an accurate biblical understanding of these subjects has, has caused a lot of people a, a lot of major problems. So it's not something that's trivia. It's, truth is, is vital. Truth is extremely important. It's unfortunate that the world is made up of mostly errors when it comes to spiritual matters rather than truth. Hence, we teach, you know, so we, we can know the truth. So, uh, Shelby, you're from Michigan. Have you ever been to hell? You haven't? No, but I have been to Paradise, Michigan, so oh. So this is a Paradise, Michigan. You failed to mention that, John. So there's a Paradise, Michigan, and there's a Hell, Michigan. <laughs> John might be one of the only people that I know that has been to the Lake of Fire, and uh, according to... Actually, I was there, too. I, yeah, yeah. What's it, what is it called again? Valley of Nam. Yeah, Nam. Yeah, Valley of Nam. Gahanna. So, uh, none of us want to go to the real one that's coming in the future. <laughs> Revelation chapter 5. We're going to look this morning primarily at the angels aspect of it and just seeing a little bit of, of what, this, what is going on in the spiritual realm. And I think next week we're going to cover uh, more on the subject of demons. I, I couldn't do it all in one week. So, um, in Revelation chapter 5, Revelation 5, Verse 11, it says, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne. John is uh, receiving a vision, a revelation, a vision about the throne room of God. He looked and he heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. And uh, 
earlier in the book of Revelation, we are given understanding that uh, there are four living creatures around the throne of God. There are four living creatures, and there are 24 elders. So that is 28 living beings, okay? Uh, that, and the, but what we just read here is, then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels, and the number of them was myriads of myriads. Myriad is a, a countless or an extremely great number. A, an ex, a countless, a countless, and thousands of thousands. In other words, there are more angels than are countable. There is myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. With the you you, you got the uh, four living creatures and the twenty four elders. That's only forty eight. So there has to be scores and scores and scores of angels in the Book of Revelation. They they're often referred to as stars. And I've wondered if they're uh, referred to as stars because of their, in addition to their brilliance and so on, but maybe because of the magnitude of stars that there are, there may just as well be that many angels. I don't really know. There's a lot of them, according to this, a number that is uncountable. And um, then look at chapter 12 of Revelation. Revelation chapter 12 is a historical overview of the past and the future. That's an odd statement. A historical overview of the past and the future. Actually, in this one chapter, it gives us an overview of the spiritual realm, starting from Genesis chapter 3 all the way to the end of the age when Christ comes back. It gives us a whole quick, very, very quick view of the spiritual realm. In, uh, and a lot of what I'm going to say to you this morning as I go through it, I'm, I'm going to tell you what these things mean, and, I'm go and I'll say this to you, that I've come to the conclusions that I have by studying the whole book of Revelation. And I don't want to take the time to, to go through every place to show you why I'm saying it means this, but I'd like for you to look for yourself. and, and um, you know, you can re read the book of Revelation for yourself and make your own conclusions. It's, it, is a, it is somewhat, some of it is somewhat uh, nebulous or gray. It's not crystal clear. Um, a great sign, it's a vision again that John received. It's a number of visions that John receives, three of them as a matter of fact. A great sign appeared in heaven, and a woman, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. When it says the sign appeared in heaven, uh, there are many that believe that the zodiac, the twelve zodiac signs that are in heaven, are, ref are reflected in this particular chapter. I don't, I don't, I've never studied the stars to know that of, uh, authoritatively myself. But the, 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 the woman here is referring to Israel. And the 12 crowns, or the 12 stars, are referring to the 12 tribes of Israel, the patriarchs themselves and maybe the 12 tribes. Uh, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. And she was with child, and she cried out being in labor and in pain to give birth. And this is the talking about not Mary, but it's talking about Israel, how Israel was, you know, came to the place now of giving birth to the Messiah. A big part of the storyline of the Old Testament is that uh, in Genesis 3.15, God prophesied uh, that there would be a time that one would be born, a, the, the seed of the woman who would crush this, you know, the serpent and destroy him. And all the way through the Old Testament, that's kind of the, the red thread of the storyline, is following the genetics, the, the, the seed of the, uh, of, the, of the woman that ends up being Jesus, and then the devil working through the people trying to destroy that seed, trying to destroy Israel. Verse 3, Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, 
a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns on his heads were seven diadems. Now the dragon, we know from verse 9, is as we will read it, it's Satan and the devil. Another sign appeared in heaven, behold a great dragon having seven heads and ten horns. Again, this is not crystal clear what this is referring to, but in the context of the verse, it may be referring to the seven continents of the world. And ten horns, horns representing power, authority, and the heads were seven diadems. And that again, a diadem is a crown signifying sovereignty. And we know from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses, verse 4, that Satan is the god of this age and that his influences are throughout the whole of the world. He has, uh, he has power in this regard. Verse 4, And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she gave birth, he might devour the child. Again, the, the tail swept a third of the stars of heaven. Here the stars, rather than referring to the, uh, Israel, the, the nations of Israel, it's referring to the angels, as it is in chapter 1, verse 20. The stars are referring to angels. And this is... This is a time in the past before Christ, long before Christ was born, before the flood, sometime after the fall or with the fall of man, that the, the, the dragon took with him one-third of the angels of heaven, and they became cohorts along with him. And in the scriptures, we now know them to be the demons that, are, that were and are existing. One third of the angel. Now, how many is one third of the angels? Well, we read earlier that there were myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. It's an uncountable number, the whole of them. Well, one third of them. No, I'm sorry, that's not true. When the, the, the verses we read in uh, Revelation were after this happened. So they were still myriads, uh, myriads and th count, you know, thousands of thousands after. So before that time, one-third of them fell with the dragon and with the devil and his uh, cohort with them. So this is the spiritual realm. This is what's going on. It's kind of a it's, it's a, it's not necessarily a pleasant thought, all of this, and I, I'm not here to please you. I'm here to, to inform you about truth and that there is this spiritual warfare that has been going on and continues to go on and will until, uh, when John shared with us last week, until the lake of fire, when the devil and all of these demons are destroyed. Now, um, before we read on to verse 5, let me, let me just show you something here. Um, like I said, one-third of the angels sided with the dragon and became demons on earth. John showed us in Jude... One book before Revelation, Jude chapter 6. And the angels, Jude, not chapter 6, Jude 6, there's only one chapter in Jude. Jude 6, and the angels who did not keep their own domain became, abandoned their proper abode, and he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of that great day. Putting that together with 2 Peter chapter 2, we learn that this is the, that during the time of the flood, that uh, a portion of those angels were put in chains. And what's the name of that place again, John? Tartaru. Tartaru. It's the only place that's used in the Bible. It is this place where these, these demons are imprisoned since the time of the flood. Obviously, not all of them are imprisoned, since there's still an abundance of evil present. Uh, but they are held in chains, and this is a good possibility, as John said last week, this is where Satan will be held in chains for a thousand years in the time to come. 
Uh, I, could, I could read you that 2 Peter chapter 2, although we looked at it last week, it won't hurt to see it again. Verse 4, and if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into Tatar too, Tartaru, and committed them to the pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. That, so that there's a portion of this one-third of the angels, a portion of them were put in chains in the time of Noah. So again, there must have been an abundance, because there's still you know, such an influence in the world today. Now go back to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. And his tail swept a third of the stars of heaven, a third of the angels of heaven. Now some of them are locked in chains, but the rest of them are still free, harassing. And they threw them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman and was about to give birth. So when she gave birth, he might devour the child. And as I said, that was the whole storyline of the Old Testament, trying to get rid of the child, trying to get rid of the child. And the, the, demon, the devil and his demons are trying to destroy the Messiah, which they thought they succeeded when they put him on the cross. So she gave birth to a son, a male child, who, ruled, who, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. He isn't doing it yet. He will. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. That's the ascension. This is a very quick thing. You know, we, now we've gone to the ascension. Jesus has ascended. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that she would be nourished for 1,260 days. Again, I kind of apologize to you for just giving you the understanding in this, of the synopsis of this thing because it would take too much time. I did a whole class on this. Now we're going from, we're just going from the ascension to the end of the age, the last three and a half years of the end of the age before Christ, when Christ comes back. And then uh, verse 7, and there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels warring with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels waged war and they were not strong enough and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven and the great dragon was thrown down the serpent of old who is called the serpent of old who is called the devil and satan who deceives the whole world he was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him then i heard a loud voice in heaven saying now when that happens now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of the brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. Now this verses 7 through 10 is not something that has happened in the past. This is something that is going to happen in the future. This is it's by the blood of the Lamb. This is, this is at that, the, right before the, at that three and a half year period of time at the end of the age when all hell is going to break loose at the end of this age when Christ comes back. That's what this is talking about. That's when that war in heaven will transpire. Now, salvation and the power, verse 10, of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of the brethren has been thrown down. And that is the devil and the demons. What they have been doing since they were of the original time when they left heaven, when that one third left, they have been the accusers of the brethren. They have been accusing the people of God and, and attacking the people of God and doing it over and over. In that day it will end. They overcame him because of the blood of the lamb. Well, they couldn't have done that before the lamb shed his blood. And because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life, even when faced with death. Now we're talking about, we're switching and talking about the believers that didn't compromise, that won't compromise in the day that's coming in the future. Again, it's, it's, a, hard, it's a hard chapter to read because it's the history of the past and the history of the future. How can you tell the history of the future? Well, that's what it's doing. For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, woe to the earth and to the sea, because the devil has come down to you, 
having great wrath, knowing that, his, that he has only a short time. And when you read the book of Revelation, it all makes sense. Those last three and a half years are going to be horrific here on earth. When the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time and a times and a half. That's three and a half years from the, from the presence of the serpent. And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out of his mouth. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. It's quite a chapter. But give you an, a little bit of an understanding of what has transpired, what is going on currently, and what is going to happen in the future. And right now, there is this, this, this warfare that continues to rage in the spiritual realm, and the ramifications of it are touches into the human realm, where these demons are harassing the saints of God. Uh, the, the women, it, initially in, in chapter 12, was talking about Israel, but by the time we get to chapter 17, it's the inclusion of the, all those that believe, which would also mean the Christian church. Look at Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. At first, this is a scary thought to think that there's an evil force being led by the devil that is, harass, is designed to harass the people of God, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Indeed, it is. But we need to have perspective here. One third of the angels, a part of now which is locked in chains, as compared to the two thirds of the angels that are on God's side. I mean, the battle is tipped in our, 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 our half. Actually, we've already seen, we just read the end of the battle. You know, the, the adversary, when Christ was raised from the dead and ascended into the heaven, the war, the, the conclusion of the war was determined. It just hasn't yet been finalized. You know, the war, the, war, the, the, the battle's over, in the, or the, the conclusion is over, but it hasn't yet been fulfilled. In Hebrews chapter 1, is this record where there is a comparison between the angels and Jesus. In verse 3, And he, Jesus, his radiance of his glory and his excellent ex, ex, extra representation, exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power, when he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high having become as much better than angels. Jesus is much better than the angels, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. And again brings, and when, the, when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, And let all the angels of God worship Jesus. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels wing, winds and his ministers of flaming fire. A little bit of an understanding of what the angels are. Uh, they're ministers of flaming fire. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is, in, is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. Verse 10, And you, Yahweh, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, that is the earth and the heavens, but you remain, and they will all become old like a garment. That's that two and a half, three and a half years that we're talking about earlier. And like a mantle, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they also will be changed. But you are the same, 
and your years will not come to an end. But which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all, talking about the angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? What are the angels for? They are to be, at least, they are not all... Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? They are ministers to us, to the heirs of salvation. And they, ha all, they have all the way through the scriptures as you study this, this subject throughout the Bible. Turn to Genesis chapter 18, please. The first time that you see angels spoken of in the scriptures is with Hagar that Sarah's maid that conceived Abram's first child, who ended up being Ishmael. That's the first time angels are talked about. They came and they ministered to Hagar, Hagar and to her son. In, in Genesis 18 is the next place that you see angels spoken about in the Bible. And uh, I wanted to just point this out to you because it's relevant to the other places in the scriptures. Now the Lord appeared to him, to Abram, by the oaks of Mere, while he, Mare, while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. And, and, the, and the record goes on. These three men, as the chapter reveals, are angels. These three men are angels. Two of these angels, two of these men, go down to Sodom and Gomorrah. The third one stays and talks to Abram. I, I, I bring your attention to this because the vast majority of time in the Scripture that angels are spoken of, or uh, in regards to their appearance here on earth, they are in the form of men. Many times... The, inter the, the interaction that they have with the other person, they, 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 the person doesn't initially understand that it's an angel because they look just like men. There are a couple of occasions where they're white, very white, like on, on, uh, in Acts chapter 1 when the, Jesus ascended, the men appeared in, in white garments. But for the most part, they just appear and they look like normal men. And, uh, but they are very far away from being normal, look, normal men. The irony of this is that in our culture, tradition, this is usually the way that angels are presented, with having wings. You see that? Is that clear? Here's another one. <laughs> Even in, in cartoons, and, and uh, you, see, you could watch cartoons today, and they'll present angels as having wings and halos and all the rest. Not one time, now listen to me, not one time in the scriptures does it say that angels have wings. Not one time in the scriptures does it say that angels have wings. There's the truth, and then there's tradition. Tradition's got them having wings. And, and uh, you know, you can go, especially you go to uh, the Sistine Chapel, you go to, uh, what do they call that place where the Sistine Chapel is? They have all this artwork, and you see uh, Michelangelo was into this, and a lot of, a lot, uh, the, the angels have always got wings. But in the scriptures, the vast majority, majority of times that you see angels, they look like men. Now, there are a couple of times the burning bush was an angel. The, the cloud, the pillar of cloud and, and, uh, that led them in the wilderness and the fire that was over, that is referred to as being an angel. But for the most part, they appear in the form of men and never with wings. I think maybe the wing thing comes 
from cherubims because in the scripture it talks about cherubims and <laughs> uh, or cherub and cherubims it's first talked about cherubims as another spiritual being they're not angels they are another spiritual being there's seraphim and cherubim seraphim is talked about one time uh, seraphim is talked about one time cherubim are talked about in Ezekiel they're first mentioned in uh, Exodus, no, Genesis chapter 3, where they're guarding the tree of life. They're talked, the four living creatures that I talked about in the book of Revelation, those four living creatures are believed to be cherubim. Satan, before he fell, was a cherub. And he then transformed into the dragon. Really, according to my understanding of the scriptures, there's only five cherubim in all of the scriptures that are mentioned. The four in Ezekiel, the four around the throne, which I think are the same four, and uh, Satan before he fell. They had wings, but I want to tell you, they didn't look like this. <laughs> and I'm not going to, the description of, just read Ezekiel chapter 1. The description of them is nothing like this. They had six wings and they had four faces, one of an eagle, one of a man, and you know, I forget what the other ones were. I mean, they have four different faces, four sides to them, and they have eyes going all the way around them. The, the description of them is scary as the thing that John taught on last week. I mean, they're, they're nothing like that. This is what tradition teaches us, cherubs. This, these are little cherubs. Right? That's Cupid. That's a, they believe that to be a cherub. This is a little cute cherubim. And the point is, we have mocked and ridiculed and diminished the significance of the spiritual beings that God communicates to us with the great accuracy. These are the four closest spiritual beings. These are the, the four closest living beings to God. They, 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 when, he trans, when he moves, they're the ones underneath him moving them, and they're the four that are guarding him in his throne. They are the, and this is what we made them out to be? Again, you get online, do Google, put in the word cherubim, and see what you find. That's where I got this from. It's pathetic. It's absolutely pathetic. That's tradition as compared to truth. If we've been lied so... so uh, outrageously about the spiritual realm, how much more so the spiritual contest and battle that we are waged in ourselves. It's mythical, it's, it's, you know, it's cartoonish, it's all fake. I want to tell you something, it's very far from fake. It is so extremely real and so vitally important that we have an understanding of what's going on in the spiritual realm. But the devil is, is very slick. He works in secrecy. He, he, you know, he does, he wants people to think that this is the way it is, that that's a, how threatening is that? <laughs> the devil, the devil himself is a fallen cherub. He don't look like that. <laughs> so throughout the scriptures, we see that the angels off, most often appear in the form of men. There are scores of records of angels and their involvement with humanity throughout the scriptures. Most evident, but not exclusive, in the Old Testament. They are frequently referred to, you see them a lot in the Old Testament. Well, you know, Genesis, I could keep on going in Genesis and show you over and over and over the, the, how these angels are involved in humanity. Well, it makes sense. They are sent out as ministers of those who are heirs of salvation and all the way through. And it's also in the book of Acts. You see in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus ascends, the angels say to them, you know, what are you staring at? Get back to Jerusalem. Do what he told you to do. In Acts chapter 5, an angel breaks Peter and John out of jail. In Acts chapter... Uh, 10, an angel speaks to Philip in Acts chapter, also in Acts chapter 10, he talks to Cornelius in Acts chapter 
12, he breaks Peter out of jail again. Yeah, pretty good at breaking people out of jail. Uh, in, in Acts chapter 12, it's the angels that uh, kill Herod. In Acts chapter 27, when Paul was on that ship that sunk, or was going down, an angel came to him and assured him that there would be a loss of no life. Look at Gen uh, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Ephesians, right before Ephesians, Galatians 3. Verse 19. Why the law then? 3.19. Why the law then? It was added, talking about the Mosaic law, because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels and by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. I wanted to just show you this, that, that the law, the Mosaic law, which is written in the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they, that revelation was given to Moses. If you read in the Old Testament, it seems as if Yahweh is talking directly to Moses. And that this, you know, he goes up to the mountain for 40 days and he gets this information. And the way it reads, it reads like Yahweh is talking directly to him. For that matter, that record that I talked about in, in uh, Genesis 18, with the, with the man that was talking to Abraham, it, he starts referring to him as Yahweh. It, it's as if the, the angels are speaking directly first person as Yahweh, but they're not. And Moses didn't have, it wasn't God speaking directly to Moses. It was angels speaking on behalf of God to Moses. That's how he wrote down the books of the Bible. The reason that this is relevant, and again, you can see this, this in reading the Old Testament, uh, most... most um, most often that it identifies the fact that there was either a man who, who was really an angel, and he, but it, when he gets into dialogue, it's as if he's talking in the first person as he is Yahweh himself. They are, they, because that's what they do. They talk and they act on behalf of Yahweh. It's not like they have an independent will and they're doing what they want to do. The ones that are the good angels, they're doing what God wants done, and they're saying what God wants said. The angels were the ones that gave Moses the revelation to write down the first five books of the Bible. Now look at chapter 1 in verse 11. This wasn't the way that Paul's writings are given to us or given to him. Paul wrote the church epistles. In, in, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 11, For I would have you to know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to men. For I neither received it from a man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul received the revelation that is written in the church epistles through Jesus Christ. Moses received the revelation that he wrote through angels. And... Um, Things changed with Jesus. Look at Matthew chapter 4. There are two times that it talks about angels and uh, Jesus being ministered to by the angels. I thought this would, would bless you. In Matthew chapter 4, in verse 11, this is that time of Jesus being tempted, the very beginning of his ministry, having gone out into the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted of the devil. And uh, at the end of this period of time, verse 11, 411, and the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. That's the, that's the first time you see when Jesus is being ministered to by angels. The next time that you see Jesus is being ministered to by angels, it's at the end of his life in the garden, in the garden of, uh, what's that garden? Gethsemane. Gethsemane. And again, he's in a period of tremendous temptation. Remember, he's, he's praying, if this cup can be passed from me. He's praying so intensely as, 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 as if it's drops of blood. It's not. It's, it's like drops of blood. So intense was his prayer. In that great time of temptation, God sent an angel again to minister to him. 
which, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Walt, the other day we were talking about temptations. Here's a wonderful thought in the context of Jesus being tempted. The angels ministered to him. In our time of temptation, maybe perhaps they're working with us too if we're seeking the help of God. Not that we now begin praying to angels. I'll hit you in the head with my shoe if you start doing that. You're missing the point. The point is worshiping God and not angels. Uh, God will tell the angels what to do. You don't need to be, get, you just mind your own business with that. Uh, now look at First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. You remember when Jesus was uh, being taken and uh, Peter cut off the guy's ear? And, he, and uh, Jesus said to Peter, don't you know that I have 12 legions of angels that my, I could call on to help? That doesn't necessarily mean that he was in charge of the angels then. I don't get that impression. I do get that impression that after, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22, he is now, he is at the right hand of God having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers have been subject to him. Jesus, I mean, the, the, uh, the mind picture, the, the graphic mind picture you get, which is, is condescension. I mean, it's, it's got to be much bigger than that. But we're given the impression of a throne room. Around the throne room, which we read in Revelation 12, there's these four... Uh, living creatures that are around the throne room and then outside of the throne are the 24 elders that are circling it. Well, Jesus went, he didn't go inside the 24, he went inside the four living creatures. He's at the right hand of the throne of God. That's where he is now. Authoritatively, authoritative, authoritatively wise, he's above the four living creatures and now the 24 elders and the myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands of angels. He is that kind of, he has that kind of authority today. One more verse of scripture to look at before we close, and that's in Daniel. You have in the Old Testament, you have Isaiah. After Isaiah, you have Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel, and then Daniel, Daniel chapter 10. Daniel is praying for Israel. And in Daniel 10, 1 through 16, we should probably just go to the time that the angel comes and talks to him. Where is that, John? Verse 10, 10, 10. Then behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man of high esteem, understand the words that I am about to tell you and stand upright, for I am now, for I have now been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. And he said to me, do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was, standing with, was withstanding me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to you an understanding of what will happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision pertains to the days in the future. The spirit, this angel comes to Daniel and says, I would have been here 21 days ago, but I had this conflict going on. I had to get Michael to help me so that I could come and talk to you now. I mean, what? There's this war that goes on that you and I are not seeing. There is this spiritual warfare 
that those one third of the angels that came with the dragon, of course the portion of them being locked in chains, they are fighting against the two thirds of the angels that are with God and with Christ and there's this warfare going on behind what we see in the human realm. We see in the human realm the manifestation of that warfare, especially in the Gospels, when we study the subject of demons, because they are directly influencing people, and Jesus cast them out. So there's this whole spiritual warfare going on, which is a, it's a kind of a scary thing. But look, here's what the scriptures say. We are more than conquerors in every situation. That's a quotation from Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 says, If God be for us, who can be against us? If Christ died for us, then what are we worried about? We, God is in Christ and Christ is in you. Therefore, we're more than conquerors. Two-thirds, now in addition to that, two-thirds of the angels are, are on God's side fighting on our behalf. It seems to me we have a very formidable force on our side. That's an understatement. That's a sarcasm. I mean, we have God, Christ, living inside us everywhere we go all the time. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. And in addition to that, we have this spiritual realm which is we don't even understand. So uh, we don't, we don't, we, we just keep on leaning on him, especially in our time of temptation. I mean, that's the most difficult times with our walk with God. That's the most difficult time of all. And we just saw that Jesus, he, he was ministered to by the angels. And we, our God, our God will take care of us in those difficult times of our life and help us to be victorious. So that's the, a little bit of the overview of the whole thing, which I know is something. And then, <laughs> and then uh, next week, and, and, and some on the angels, next week we'll see more about demons. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for your kindness again, for helping us understand truth as opposed to tradition, lies, and errors. And thank you for us to have confidence in you that you will take care of us and watch over us. We are so blessed to have you as our Father and Christ as our Lord and to have the Holy Spirit in us and to have the word of truth so that we might know the truth and live by the truth. I thank you for these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.